I have a, I had a sense of I, I I think I developed a stronger sense of my koi my koi uh, heritage when I was in the states, and and it was probably because of my contact with the Native Americans there, and also Maoris and people that I've met there from indigenous descent. And 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 I started thinking about our own heritage, our koi heritage, and I realized that when you arrive from, and actually when I arrived from the States, there is no, there, we, are, we are totally invisible when you arrive in South Africa. Uh, this was our land. This is where the koi lived not too long ago. And and not a single, there's, there's, there are no signs that these people, they totally disappeared off the face of the earth here. And I thought that this should be something that we really need to change. So my awareness started way back in, 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 in 1994. I was away in the beginning, but I think my activism started in 94. So I did a lot of stories for news where I often go back into history and give context. For instance, they would send me to a story about the white man that camped off the Zwine River, you know, they in George. This guy had the audacity to take land from at the mouth of the Zwine, of the Gwine, the Gwine River, I think it's called. And and by the way, Ernie else has got a big estate just on the opposite side. And on this side, some white guy uh, 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 decided to block off, I think he got the land from the there was some corruption in, in, in George uh, with the ANC, um, and they gave this guy this land. But this guy then put, put up fencing and made his own little resort there. And people that were fishing there for for how many generations had suddenly had no access to, they couldn't walk around the, the, the curve there to go and fish. And people couldn't go there. You have to pay to go there and spend uh, and enjoy the, the river mouth. So when I did that story, I went, I specifically sketched the background and said that this, not too long ago, this was the traditional land of the, um, I can't remember the tribe that lived there, the Khorikwas, I think. Captain Dukop, I went to know that. History was his name. Uh, there were Pakal's Dorpies today. There was a Koi tribe that lived there. Um, and and they were subsequently um, uh, probably removed. And then now what you have today is the situation of this river being camped off by somebody who came from Europe and who was a descendant of people that um, did countless atrocities uh, to the people that are living there. So uh, that that's just one example of story I did. So I, I did a lot of my stories that I did would always, I would try to reflect on and bring in the indigeneity, you know, and bring in the indigenous people and their impact or, 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 or give background to who lived here before. I mean, uh, it, it irks me when, when they play rugby, for instance, when they play in Newlands or Cape Town, and they don't give, before the game, no, in, no, there's no acknowledgement of that these were sacred lands of the Koi, as they do in Australia and in, 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 uh, with the Maoris, uh, New Zealand. Um, they acknowledge at least there. I mean, they are just as bad there, but they at least there's a start. And I think that should happen here as well. Um, when the rugby game starts here at, at, at Newlands or now at Cape, um, at the Cape Town Stadium, they would have Zulu dancers entertaining the guests before the before um, before the, the spectators. Uh, there would be Zulu dancers running out and performing which I feel is an insult to the local indigenous people that uh, that are here still today. Uh, they didn't disappear 
um, as we as we were made to believe, they are still this is uh, uh, the descendants, the blood of of those are still in us. Yeah. So and and and, and I'm I'm glad you 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 bring this up because what you just now said is the invisibility. There's this kind of invisibility. Is this people are ignoring um, the koi koi and the sun people. In South Africa, yeah, and so yeah. yeah, but but not the sun that much. The, the sun is still kind of recognized um, in South Africa, yeah. but the Khoi Khoi people is kind of they completely um, er- erased in South Africa. They didn't exist. Uh, but then your series uh, hit um, the the television, which kind of going against the grain. And I must say, it's a it's 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 phenomenal. Um, the success is 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 phenomenal. But the way you curated it. Uh, the way it's embedded in into history, the way you brought in scholars to come speak about what happened here, but then you also bring in the kind of marginalized voice into the conversation and say like, oh, but these things didn't change. Uh, you you took people through the historical sites. You took people through um, mm-hmm. where uh, the indigenous knowledge, how this indigenous knowledge is still in people. So. Yeah. And and you went all over all over uh, the Northern Cape, the Western Cape, um, uh, and and Eastern Cape. So it, it's beautifully curated. So yeah, it, where did where did this started? Um, and what were some of the challenges you had to overcome to tell the story and get it onto TV? Because this is not a type of story that you normally see on TV or even a series that you want on TV. Yeah, the, the, the biggest struggle, the biggest struggle was to get it on the SABC because we always felt that is where it should be first. We can always stream it afterwards and, you know, put it on Netflix or Showmax or wherever. Uh, but but it was to get an ordinary person to see it. Um, and, and SABC is probably the, with all the criticism, it's probably still the best platform for that. Um, and, it's, and, and especially SABC 2, is where the people, you know, whose your real target audience was actually SMBC too, even though you want everybody to see it. Um, yeah, so the biggest struggle was to get it onto the broadcaster. It took me probably five years to get it onto SMBC um, because the program was in 2018. Yeah, in 2017, 2018, before we finished editing, I already had meetings with the SABC way back. I flew up there. I met, met with them. I pitched it. I showed them a, a clip. They loved the idea. The group that watched it loved the idea, loved the, 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 the But the first thing they said to me, there is no money. They don't have money. So I said, well, okay, but uh, we'll talk again. And they also gave me ideas on how to pitch it. Uh, it should be pitched as a um, fully funded program because it's already, uh, 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 there's no money. They don't have to actually pay. They have to pay for a broadcasting license fee. So that I did in 2020, 2019, 2020. Um, the first positive feedback was in 2021, um, near the end, when I spoke to a high-ranking uh, person in SABC who deals with content. He put me onto a few other names, and I send them um, screeners, as we call it, to watch. And they obviously like the, the, the screeners, but nothing happened. So it took us another two years, uh, the whole of, of 21, end of 21, 22, nothing happened. It was near the end of 22 when I started really getting uh, them to come to me and say, look, we are ready. Um, let's do the paperwork. And then it took us a while to get the paperwork done and to get the uh, licensing agreement in place. And finally, it was screened in January 23. And I thought, yes, it is a historic moment. It's the first time that the SNBC screened something of that significance or that that comprehensive. They have screened stuff in the past, but it would be snippets of our history. But um, eventually they 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 did 
uh, come to the party and you know I'm, I'm grateful that they did um I personally I feel there was a problem with it you know the load shedding was a huge problem because the slot was at, at the time when a lot of people had load shedding from eight to ten so I had so many people sending me messages we can't watch it where else can we watch it and then the SMBC told me, but there is a, uh, what's it called, uh, SMBC Plus, and you can watch it there. But you need Wi-Fi to watch it on SMBC Plus. And also, um, I think it was a one-stop on SMBC Plus. I don't know if there's a catch-up. I'm not sure. Um, so hopefully they will rebroadcast it anyway, but that's probably going to be in another year. They will rebroad because they have the option. The uh, you you were asking about the challenges. So in in in, in putting it together, the the obviously challenge was what do you leave out and what do you leave in? Uh, because by no means, and I'm not as arrogant to think that I've covered the story. I've touched the, the highlights of the story. Because if you read um, Nigel Penn's books and if you read what uh, Breda Camp wrote and you and you read all these books. Um, you can't go into that detail. There's a lot of detail there that you can go into. So I, I, I basically, I think this is just a one, a, a koi koi one hundred one. You know, for people that want to get into the history and learn about the history, this is like an entry level, almost like an entry level course into what is the history of the koi koi. Um, and also, um, so. The difficulty was then to get the funding to do this. Um, and that took almost, we started talking in 2010. It took us six years to get the funding together. So um, I, st I started writing proposals in 2010. And it's only in 2016 that the lotto gave money for this to be made uh, after many attempts. And credit must go to Rudy Riga, who relentlessly uh, sent in uh, proposals every year. Uh, in, uh, and eventually they gave money to for this to be made. But the production itself went smooth uh, because places are still there. Uh, the people are still there. You can just you must just travel and go find them and tell those stories. And um, and that was the the best part is was to travel and to go and tell those stories, and 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 uh, and and the people like uh, Brendan Camp, uh, uh, Villa Busak, they were just as too willing to impart with their knowledge, because their knowledge is in books, it's written in books, and it's sitting somewhere, but it doesn't always reach the people, the ordinary people. Uh, you know, people don't read, so here is now their chance to, you know, highlight um, their, their own research and put it on, on a big uh, on a big platform. Um, uh, Villa Busak's insight into Christianity and the Koi is priceless. Um, I still hear him in my head, you know, when he talks about the how the Koi became Christians. But in the same Voice. You also look at the negative side of, of 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 the missionaries and the mission work that was done. I mean, there were there were missionaries that were real gangsters. If you look at the one that um, um, Zayden Faden, who who raped women there in, 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 in Zirbra, it's well documented that he was appeared in front of a. London Missionary Society uh, Tribunal for um, he, he didn't rape her, but he, he attempted to, he was molesting her, the, the woman that worked for him, a koi woman. Um, on five occasions, he tried to have sex with her against her will, uh, where he would try to overpower her. It's only because she's maybe physically strong that he couldn't do it. But, but this thing is, you know, it was an ongoing thing anyway. But uh, for a minister, I mean, for a, for a missionary to do that, that was the only stuff he did. He did a lot of uh, uh, um, 
So it's Nigel, uh, Nigel Payne wrote about him and called him the, the wolf in sheep's clothing because of the stuff he did in Pella, in the Northern Cape. And then uh, he just carried on with whatever he did there in, in, yeah, in Sibra. But he's not the only one. Uh, there were good missionaries, but there were these missionaries that were actually just rogue elements who also contributed to stealing land, uh, who deliberately um, changed people's attitude towards their own culture, uh, who made people ashamed of their culture, who made people ashamed of their language. And and that is not something you should just sweep under the mat. It's something which we should talk about, how the missionaries contributed to the loss of culture, language, um, and spiritual beliefs. I mean, according to Villa, it all they needed was to acknowledge the spiritual life of the coin and embrace it and combine it with the Christianity uh, message. Uh, that, that's his view. Uh, other people might differ, but um, um, to get back to the Koi Saga, the title is Koi Koi Saga. Wasn't my choice of title. It is. It was eventually grew out of many discussions. My title was Real People. The Real People. Because Koi Koi means what, the name that they gave themselves is real people. And um, um, we had um, arguments over it. And, and eventually, I I gave in and, and I said, okay, Koi Koi Saga is close enough because um, it's still, you know, uh, it also the name is there, Koi Koi, so that, you know, people in, instinctively will remember that name. Um and, and saga, obviously, because it's not a small story. It's a, it's an epic, which is ongoing. It started somewhere and it's ongoing. Okay, brilliant. Because I wanted to ask you about saga, and and now I, uh, um, now it makes sense. It's it's this epic story that you're telling. And the one thing that I must say is that I I want to thank you, the producers and everyone that was involved in this particular production, because. As, as a researcher myself in this particular field, you can only read so many people and so many things. And most of the things like you've mentioned, like uh, Dr. Vilabusak, um, uh, Yati's work, all of them, Prof. Bredenkamp's work, all of their work is in is is, is circulated in university circles. Um, mm. So it's it's constantly there and, and the conversation is there, but that story never reaches uh, the population. And, and I... Mm could see the response when this hit South African TVs um, this year. It was just amazing of how people, it's like the amnesia is lifted. Like this is in our family all of along. So now people are coming out, they're more proud, they're more outspoken. So I think the reception of, of, of the Koiko saga is, is brilliant. And, and, and I think you have achieved, um, they, they, they can be more be done, but I think, like you said, is the conversation is there now. It's, 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 yeah. Anyone who wants to do a, a film, a documentary or something has to come back to the specific work where like, but you guys have to look at Johan Abrams' work. Yeah, you, you cannot gloss over it. So they have to kind of, if, if they want to do a counter, then they have to engage with your work. If they want to work with your work, they have to engage your work. So I think... It's extremely important. So just about the reception, before I go into the last two questions, how did you find the reception and, and how do you feel as a filmmaker what the kind of reception that you got? You know what? I was overwhelmed by the positive responses. As a journalist, as an investigative journalist, somebody that worked for special assignment, when your show goes out, you are very nervous uh, on that Tuesday night when your show airs you are extremely nervous because you don't know what's going to come out of what people are going to say um, because most of the stuff is controversial. And I thought my my, 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 my feeling with the Koi Saga was the same. I felt that first night I was like terrified almost. I was like, oh my God, I wonder what's going what's gonna to be the response. I knew there would be a positive response, but I was waiting for the backlash. 
You know, there's always that other group that's coming at you. Uh, people that will question your research. Um, people that, yeah, uh, that's what I was, was waiting for. And it never happened. It was overwhelmingly the what I saw on, on, on Facebook and, and on other platforms. Overwhelmingly, it was positive. 99.99 almost. There was like one or two negative responses that I saw from somebody that made a ridiculous statement. Um, and then one one statement came from Khrikwas, who didn't see the program yet. They heard that there's going to be this program about the Khrikwas. And they were actually participants, but they forgot who it was that interviewed them. So they, they totally forgot. Remember, it's been like I interviewed them in 2017 or 2018, 2017, yeah. So other people interviewed them subsequently about similar stories, uh, but which didn't air yet. So they were they they were uh, uh, very upset that they hear now. Uh, they saw maybe a promo on TV that they appearing in a documentary about Khrikwas. These were Khrikwas in Kokstad. And I had a lengthy conversation with him. And I said, but listen, you haven't seen the program yet. Maybe you should watch the program and then come back to me. Because what they were, uh, their beef is with the with the cocks. The, the, the ones that I, that, that uh, or, or, or the, sorry, with the Lafleurs. They were they were so negative, and then I then I realized they haven't seen it. They, I mean, they haven't seen it yet. Then I told them watch it, and I told them and 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 I said that I value your input because I told them let's do a Hikwa story about the Hikwas, all the the, the the whole story, the saga of the Hikwas, because there's enough material there, and let's keep in touch. And and and, and they were then very happy, and and then they realized who I was. You know, uh, because they, they forgot about that interview. And then they watched it and they were very happy. I didn't hear from them again. They they were they were very happy uh, from what I could see in, in comments. Um, because I dealt with it without the controversy of the cook and the... I mean, history is history. You can't change that. So without giving... Uh, the way I handled it was I told the story chronologically as that. I mean, Adam Cook the third died. There was no real successor. So um, the daughter, one of the cook, Mace Cook's daughter, I think, married Abraham Stockers from Lafleur. So subsequently he became the leader. I mean, there was no... So so if you just follow... I mean, I just followed the history as it went. And then subsequently, you know what happened? They moved away back to Cape. Beerswater and what the other place, Ratlachat and Kranzu. These are all historical facts. You can't ignore that. Uh, those are facts. And, um, uh, and I steered away from the whole controversy. So, yeah. Um, but it was interesting, the, the comments from people. And largely what I liked was the fact that people said, this is history I didn't know. I'm glad for this program because my eyes opened. I, could, I didn't even know this. Um, I didn't understand the history. What is Koi? What is Sun Bushman and Otanto? What's the difference? How did they get here? And and all of that. So I think the film, in a simplistic way, tells that story. Um, and but but the the big thing is what I want. Maybe you are gonna you're probably gonna ask me this. So let me get into it. Is what now? Yes. And I think what would happen now is that this story should go this simplified one and there is a film version like a a, a one and a half hour uh, less than one and a half hours little over an hour there's a condensed version which you can easily show to children in high school and i and, and i think it's the great sevens that need to watch it because they're dealing with south african history that's Austin of faith the yeah? great sevens and 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 i think then later in the the great I think it's 11 or 12 should watch it as well. But especially the great sevens. Because they deal with Koi, with the, 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 
with the arrival of Adribiak and all that history. So, so the one thing that uh, I recently kind of um, at school, I kind of had a, a gripe with one of the teachers because um, of how the history was told about the Koina Sun. So you still have largely white teachers that is telling the Tandribik uh, story and not yeah. uh, the, the standard um, history that, you, that, that you're supposed to get. So I, I was a, a little bit annoyed uh, with that. So, so and, and I agree with you, there, there's a certain group of young people or, or kids that have to, to, to listen to this particular story, but also engage with it. But with the screening um, in, in, at Sea Point, I told you about uh, animation, and I think animation, uh, animated series of this would also do great because yeah. it can go younger, uh, reach a, a, a younger audience. Um, yeah. Because but there is a lady that's, um, what's her name, Deirdre Yankees. Um, she, she's written a book called Stories, Stories and Event. It was that, and she's busy with. Um, she's, she's passionate about doing a whole series, an animated series of koi stories, which um, I hope she will get it, get it right, or get the funding to do it, because all it is, it's about money. Yeah. Um, it's all it, because it's costly to animation. Yeah. So, so just the final question. Um... And it's a little bit about politics, um, and it's kind of behind the scenes because you belong in uh, with the SBC. Why is there such a silence in the SBC or just the film industry in general when it comes to the koi koi and the sun people? Because I generally, uh, I've, I've submitted work that relates to the stories, but then they don't get uh, picked up by festivals or they just simply ignored it's like um and then you see what comes out of festivals it's like but the things that i that i should or produce is much better than this mm -hmm. kind of 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 flavorless thing that you're sitting here yeah, for audience yeah, yeah. so just a little bit of politics before we say goodbye yeah look I, first of all we are marginalized people we, we our numbers are small we are seen we are insignificant if you look at the big numbers in South Africa of other groups. Um, and I think that that is the one reason. Um, as I'm just an African, you're a Taliban. You know, you're so belangriki. I think it's that attitude now in government as well that they will, they will when, when, when it's election time, then they remember us. Uh, people often say it, but it is true. Um, they will factor us in when it comes to elections. But other than that, we're not seen as a serious group of people with a with a beautiful history, which is also their history, uh, the, the rest of the country's history. Our history is, is, is South African history, is the foundation history of this country, and it should be seen as such. Uh, it shouldn't be seen as their history or the, the Bushmans and the Ottentotters' history. Um, it, it should be seen as a collective history of South African history. And, the, and it should enjoy that importance. Uh, this is the reluctance of, of naming streets after um, Chamao or Kratoa or Namoa or uh, Honomoa. I mean, why why is it that, that we don't you know that, that they don't do that? Um I mean we have voices in parliament, we have voices in, in in local government, but either those guys don't talk about it or don't make enough noise about it. Um but I think it's 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 first of all it's because we are a marginalized group. But but that shouldn't be the case in the Western Cape. Uh, if you want to, if you want to show our presence, um, um, there there are enough people that can that should carry that torch. When it comes to projects, uh, film projects, it was always ignored. You know, stories of I mean, the the uh, uh, um, 
it's also uh, they are not enough filmmakers. Our, our own filmmakers um, ignore the stories. They they tend to go for stories about gangsterism. It was always like the kid gangster. That's the story. Um, there are not many filmmakers or skilled filmmakers that can make films about the koi or or historical films uh, or that would go into that venture. So maybe things will change there in that case. In our, I'm now talking about in our business, in our industry. Um, I have a feature film called Benigna, which is the story of that woman from Mamre, which is, but the story has so many changes that I don't know, the family, I might have to change the name of the story because uh, I've, I've made so many changes to the narrative. But um, that will be a test. But they've already given the go-ahead for the script to be written. So they paid for development money, the NVF, the National Film and Video Foundation. So now we are pitching in June, July, we are pitching for production money. That's a that's a two that will be a, a, a two million injection from them if they if they give it. Once if they if, if they go if they give the green light for that, then we you can say we've turned the we've turned the corner almost in terms of our uh, stories. Um, so maybe slowly, you know, there's there's a, there's a, a, an awareness growing of there are these people with an interesting history. And it's stories that need to be told. Johan, thank you very much. Thank you for opening the doors um, and be the first one to kind of walk in the kind of post-apartheid era or even the post-post-apartheid um, era to open these kind of doors. So filmmakers like me, researchers like me, and many other that is coming so that you you have opened the door now for us and, and kind of shown us the opportunities and, and this can can be done. Because I would tell you, if I have to struggle five years <laughs> to get something to, to on 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 um SCBC, it'll be it uh, I'm part of that generation, I'll put it on YouTube. Um but then you do, don't make <laughs> you don't make the kind of impact um that that, that that you are doing. So thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I, I I appreciate sitting and talking to me, and I think this will be quite a treat uh, for for my audience. It's between the ages of twenty five to forty five. Those most of the people watching my stuff. So I think they are kind of the next generation that needs to take these stories and opportunities forward. So Johan, bye bye, Danke. Thank you very much, Kei Thank you. Thank, thank thank you for the opportunity to to um, to highlight this. Um, our story and then to make people aware of it.